Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom. This is Torah study for a Shabbos morning, Valley Beth Shalom uh, Torah study, and I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein, and joined this morning by my dear friend, Rabbi Mark Gelman, and Hello. we're delighted to have you with us this morning to study the Torah portion and to spend a little Shabbos time with us this morning. We are smack in the middle of the book of Exodus, and right in the core, right in the fulcrum of that book is this chapter, the section we read this morning, happens to be named for Moses' father-in-law, Yitro, uh, who is the priest of Midian. Moses, having brought his people out of Egypt, are now camped beside Mount Sinai. Yitro meets him there with his, uh, brings Moses' his wife and kids to, to, to be with him. And Yitro, who knows how to manage a people, because he's the priest of Midian, watches Moses make every mistake in the book. And uh, much like a kindly uh, uh, mentor, father-in-law, shows him this is how you do it. You engage a community of, of assistants to help you, and you don't have to carry this people on your back all by yourself. And then the Torah portion moves to the event, the core event of the Bible, the revelation of God at Mount Sinai. Chapter 19 takes us to Mount Sinai and to this experience of revelation, this experience of God entering our world, God intruding upon our reality. And chapter 20 is the recitation of the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, the Ten Statements that God gives this people. Now, we want to focus this morning on that question, on that remarkable and difficult and puzzling moment. What does it mean to say, God said it? The, the most common verse in the Bible that's repeated again and again and again, as we'll see from here forward, God spoke to Moses, and this is what he said. What does that mean, God spoke to Moses? What does it mean, God spoke to the people? What does it mean in chapter 19 when it says, God comes down on the mountain? How do you understand that? How do you even begin to uh, imagine it? How do you visualize it? Uh, the the Torah tells us there was thunder and lightning and smoke and earthquake and volcano. and Because it's the Torah's way of trying to say, I have no idea how to understand it. It must have been pretty amazing. Special effects must have taken place. So the question is, what does it mean? And what's the deeper truth? Now, this truth is one of these truths that's so important. The American Constitution, by analogy, begins with the statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, that is American civilization begins with those words, rather. And, and the idea that a civilization is based on a, on a truth that is accepted, this sort of fundamental, basement, foundational truth, and everything is built upon it. The Declaration of Independence is built on that idea. The Constitution is built on that idea. Our civilization, our, our values are built on inalienable truths of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the equality of human beings, etc. For the Jewish community, the inalienable truth was that God entered the world and gave us a truth, and that truth is called Torah. And all of Judaism is built on this idea that we didn't just make this stuff up. God gave us this truth. It came from beyond, from from beyond our own abilities, a transcendent truth that we cling to. And the question this morning that Rabbi Gelman and I are, are still trying to figure out, and this is something that all Jews wrestle with, is what on earth does that mean? Mark, what on earth does that mean? I don't know. I'm in sales. I'm not in management. No, no. Come on. What does that mean? <laughs> Look, I, so let's start where you started, which is, I think, the right way here in America to start this discussion with the declaration and Jefferson's luminous words. Most people, I think, don't know that those weren't his words in the first draft, that Franklin and other less religious types said to, to Jefferson, we have to change what you wrote in the preamble. We hold these truths to be and Jefferson's word in the first version was, we hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created equal. And, and that makes sense. That sentence, we hold these truths to be sacred, 
that all men are created equal makes sense. Of course, it involves a religious belief, but it makes sense that way. The sentence as we have it in the Declaration makes no sense. It's manifestly false, in fact, which is we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator. Okay, it is, I'm a philosopher. It is not self-evident. What is self-evident is I'm holding a mouse, okay, a computer mouse. That's self-evident because of empirical evidence. I see it, I can touch it that way. That's self-evident. It's self-evident that we are mortal. Uh, Plato's first syllogism, you know, all men are mortal. You know, Plato is a man, therefore Plato is mortal. It's a classic syllogism. That's self-evident. It's self-evident that the, the sum of the squares of an isosceles triangle are equal to the square of the other side. That's my version of the Pythagorean theorem. That's self-evident. It is not self-evident that we are created equal. It's just not. In fact, you look around at people, it's obvious we're not equal. Some people are higher, taller, shorter, more coordinated. Some people are more successful. So there's all these differences. So, and of course, we have different skin colors and we have different gender orientation, all sorts of things which can be used to distinguish people and to diminish their, their, their sanctity. The only way, the only way to live in a community of flourishing is to affirm something that cannot be affirmed by logic. And that is, despite all the clear differences between people, all people share one important source of their dignity, and their rights. And that one thing is they are not, they don't get these rights through the state. No one can vote to, to make you all people equal. People are equal and the state must reflect that. It's not that the state enacts that. But if there is no God, the highest level is the state. And a state can say like, Nazi Germany, yes, we're voting, and not all people in Germany are equal. Jews are viruses, Jews, you know, need to be exterminated. So unless we have a transcendent source of our of human dignity, of human rights, then we are constantly at risk of the state taking our dignity, our rights away. And that was what Jefferson understood. And that was the point of the, ten, of the declaration. And, but he was forced to change it to self-evident because it was less controversial than starting it, we hold these truths to be sacred because ultimately deists like Jefferson and others and atheists would say, well, do I have to believe in that to live in America? Do I have to believe in the sacred? Well, I don't believe in the sacred. I don't believe in God. And they wanted to include everyone. So they did it that way. So the very first point about revelation from God is that it is politically and practically necessary that we have a transcendent source of our dignity. And that's the first meaning of revelation. Now, what does it mean? How do, we, how do we know that God gave us these things? Well, we know by the example of people and cultures that follow these laws, don't kill innocent people, don't steal. We, we, know, we know that people who follow that flourish and people who don't are ultimately defeated. The psalmist tells us that in almost every psalm. So that idea that God has come to us and revealed something doesn't necessarily mean exploding mountains. It can be as simple as the verse in Torah, the still small voice. It can be our rational capacity to think through how do we want to relate to each other 
And the only way that I can see that we have a way out of this is to believe that God made each of us in God's image, and that is a belief, and that belief was revealed. So you're, the claim is that um, a civilization needs to be based on a transcendent value, on a value that's given from beyond itself. Absolutely. As a foundational value. And then one builds a structure on top of it. Right. And then the state can't take away your rights because the state didn't give you your rights. Right. So, so th there's a wonderful kind of meditation on this. So the question is, what was revealed to the Jewish people, to the Israelites on Mount Sinai? Now, if you were to ask your local Orthodox rabbi, the rabbi would tell you all of, Everything. Torah, Everything. All of Torah, which means all of the written Torah and all of the oral Torah. In, there's a wonderful sentence in the Talmud that says, even a question that an insignificant student will ask his master generations from now was already revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. So the idea that all of Torah was given, and logically that makes no sense, but what's being said there is that the entirety of the religious corpus carries the same authority as whatever God said on Mount Sinai, that the authority stretches all the way one of the best examples of this, of course, is, is we, we uh, on Hanukkah, for example, we, we give a bracha, we light the candle, and we say, Baruch, Sher Kitshanu Mitzvotah V'Sivanu, Lahadlik Ner Shel Hanukkah. Blessed is God who has commanded us to light candles on Hanukkah. Now, I dare you to find me where in the Torah God said light Hanukkah candles, right? Because Hanukkah didn't come to be till generations and generations and generations after the Torah. But the idea that it's not just the Torah, but the entirety of the Torah tradition, all of the interpretation that included Hanukkah was given on Mount Sinai, gives us that bracha, that idea. Then there was a more restrictive idea that said, no, 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 not the entirety of the Torah, just the written Torah, just the five books of Moses. And what the rabbis did with it, their expansion in Talmud and Midrash and tradition, that came later. That's a human addition, a human rendition, shall we say, of the original revelation, which is the five books of Moses. But then what happens, of course, is that we look into the five books of Moses and you say, there are things there that couldn't have been said. First of all, the last six verses tell how Moses died. So how did Moses write that? So even Ibn Ezra points this out, you know, the great medieval Torah scholar. So they say, well, not the, not the entirety of the Torah. This next opinion says, maybe just the Ten Commandments. They're just the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the core of Torah. All the other commandments are expansions upon that one. You see, what's happening here, of course, is that the zone of God, of God's law, is getting smaller, and the zone of human addition and redemption and interpretation is getting bigger. The problem, of course, that they're arguing about is that we human beings bring our own culture into the mix. And if you're asking what in the Torah is eternal and eternally true, and what is a cultural addition? What is a cultural uh, affectation that's added to this? I'll give you interest, an interesting example it has to do with, well, when my wife was my wife was one of the very first women to be ordained by the conservative movement. And there was a tremendous argument at the seminary when we were students there about whether the exclusion of women from the rabbinate was God's idea, or was this just the way that the community dealt with women over the generations? Was it a cultural expression and not an eternal expression? And that's what's being negotiated here. What's cultural, which is historic, which goes according to the way we look at things today, but maybe not tomorrow. And what's eternal? Then there was another rendition. I'm going to keep going. Hang on. Which said, not all 10 commandments, just the first one. In other words, God shows up and says, hi, I'm God. who took you out of the land of Egypt, period. That's all. Everything else follows from that. And then a really more radical version of it said, not even the whole commandment, just the first word which is Anochi, which means I am. God shows up and says, I am. And we 
create a religious culture that tries to expand upon the idea of what is expected of human community and human individuals in the face of a living God who's there. And then, of course, you know, the most radical one is the one from the Rav Shitzreve, the great Hasidic rabbi, who said it wasn't even the first word. It was just the first letter. And the first letter of the first word of the first ten of commandment is an aleph. And as every Hebrew school kid can tell you, an aleph is a silent letter. So God shows up and opens up a zone of silence. And it's in that mystical, magical zone of silence, that mystical aleph, that God lives. God didn't need to say a word. We create a whole religious civilization in order to respond to the gift of God's presence in the world, to the sense of God's presence in the world, to the, to the we, we, we interpret the imperatives that are incumbent upon us. How do you live in the face of a God who shows up that way? And those are all the different versions that I could think of, 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 of what happened on Mount Sinai. Right. So, Rabbi Gelman, what happened on Mount Sinai? I think you're right. On Those are all the versions. And we don't know which it was. But what we do know, and the, the most important thing to know about all those versions, is that all of them don't answer this question. What if we're wrong on the way we alter the reverend or expand upon or elaborate or unfold this revelation, whether it's the first letter, the first word, or just a breath, how, what if we're wrong about that? After all, we're admitting that we have elaborated the revelation. And then the question is, well, all right, you're not, we're not God, so we could be wrong about that. And that is where I think the whole point of revelation is to teach us that God really didn't give us any words. I'm very much a part of that idea that it was the silent out, but it expresses a presence that God is there and God created us in God's image. And, the, and what does that mean to be created in God's image? It doesn't mean we have a big toe like God is a big toe. It, and it, what it means is we can think. We can think and God thinks. God, in fact, according to Aristotle, was noesis noiosis, thought thinking itself. Because for him, God couldn't think of anything beneath God, so God could only think of the highest thing, which was God. So, But for Aristotle, God is thought. For us, God is thought. And that means when we are actualizing our imago dei, our being made in the image of God, we are, we are thinking and evaluating the standards of how we will live. But we're doing it in the presence of a God who created us, able to think. And that, in the Middle, middle Ages and in the early modern period, is called natural law. It's the idea, essentially, and Moses Mendelssohn in Jewish philosophy is the first one to build it, which is to explain it this way. He said, look, we, uh, we believe that God revealed lo tigno, don't steal, but, and that that's a revelation from God and people, Jews can follow that and, don't, and not steal because of that. Rational people, philosophers and others can say, there's reasons not to steal. Kant made a whole argument about it. He was a pious Lutheran. And he said, there's reasons you can't steal because if everyone steals, there's no private property. Everyone's running around killing each other. And then you can't build a civilization. So there's rational reasons to have a civilization built upon the notion that you can't steal. So Ramelza says, there's two ways to get to the same don't steal. You can get to it by believing in revelation, or you can get to it by your unaided human reason. And that's why I've never really felt that there was a conflict 
between reason and revelation. It's just two ways up the mountain to the same goal. Now, there is a factor that is troubling to Orthodox Jews, to not Orthodox Jews, but fundamentalist Jews. I distinguish between Orthodoxy, which in a way I am, even though I'm not a mitzvah observer in that way, and fundamentalism. It's, and that's that what you can understand in it is God gives us the ability to think our way into the right behaviors. And those right behaviors are actually the nature of God's revelation to us. And it's actually the reason of what it means by what any student in any age will discover is revealed on Sinai. Yes, I believe that. And I believe it in this way. It means whatever a rational, loving, compassionate, kind, and wise thinker will evolve as a principle in every age, that's what God intended. And it just took you a while to get there. There's no question that God intended my daughter to have the same spiritual horizons as, as my son. No question about that to me rationally. All distinguish all the orthodox rules of preventing women from doing it are clearly our creation and wrong, in my view. But the way that we the way that we understand that is is through the evolution of women's rights, and and those are all that's a good thing. When we read the curse of Eve after the apple incident in the garden. It says, You're, you will have pain in childbirth and your husband will rule over you. That's, that's not a revelation to God. Or to put it in the language that Martin Buber did, I cannot hear God's voice speaking through that verse. I cannot hear God's voice speaking through that verse. So what we have in the Torah is very much an admixture. When I teach children, I said, you know, when you're looking through, there's a trees in front of you and there's a house behind the trees and you're trying to look at the house, but the trees sort of block the house, but you can see a little of it. That's exactly what it means that the Torah is revealed by God. Some of it, you're seeing the house. Do not steal. I'll take no, do, do not uh do, do, don't 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 be afraid don't kill people who are innocent that's the house but things like a man should rule over a woman or uh the killing of the amalekites or the taking of a woman in a, as a war prisoner or killing a disobedient son that stuff is clearly not revealed by God. Why is it clear? Because human reason can't support such a behavior. And that's what the revelation means. It means our use of our reason to bring God's words and hope into the world. But what happens when reason results in two very opposite moral positions that argue with each other. Ah, what happens then is a conversation. Ed. You have a conversation and you say, okay, I'd like to hear your reasons why you believe a man should rule over a woman. I want to hear your reasons. And if they're good reasons, I have to respond to them. If they're bad reasons, I have to tell you, look, that's a bad reason. It's a bad reason. And there's but what, what makes something a good reason or a bad reason? Well, for Kant, it was universalizability, which is right. My, but so my, my traditional neighbor would say to me um, that that we're a better universalizability. The world would be better if men had their roles and women had their roles and we kept them separate. And and he lives a traditional life where men and women live very separate kinds of roles. Each one has their own place in the world. I yeah. look at that and say that's immoral because you are limiting the, as you said, the religious horizons, the the developmental horizons of 
of women. You're tell what you're really doing is repressing women, and you're not giving them a different role. You're giving them a lesser role, a supportive role. And Correct. he says that's but that's the better place for women. How do you how do you distinguish between good reasons and bad reasons? If they're all, if 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 there's not, on what basis do you make that distinction? By looking at the nature of the reason. So it's unjust that that conclusion. Women shouldn't be allowed to read from the Torah or whatever. Right. That's an unjust thing because it's a it's a discrimination based on an irrational fact, which is, if you say, a person should not be allowed to read Torah, if <laughs> They're they're blind, let's say. So, okay, well, maybe that has some fact, but there could be a Braille Torah or whatever. But it's certainly a rational reason to say if you're reading Torah, you got to be able to see the Torah. It is not a rational reason to say that because you're a woman, you can't read the Torah. It's like saying if you're a black person, you can't sit at that lunch counter. Now, there may be some reasons why a person can't sit at a lunch counter that are rational. The guy is full of, you know, tar or, you know, oil, or he comes in out of a work zone. He says, sir, you can't sit at the looking, you can't sit here looking like that's a rational reason not to sit at a lunch counter. But because you're black, you can't sit at a lunch counter is an irrational reason. And that's how ethical philosophers talk. And that's why I, as a professor of philosophy, why I get so crazed about it. When I talk to people, I said, this is a form of philosophy everyone needs. Everyone needs ethics because you need to be able to distinguish between good and bad reasons. And so, there's, there's, so let, that's let's how pursue, you do it. Let's pursue this, okay? So when I read something in the Torah, yeah, and I have a sense that that doesn't, it, that's not right. Okay. That's not a law we should keep. That's okay. a law that, as you said, is irrational in this, but but more than irrational, it it violates my inner sense of right and wrong. Yeah, it's inju unjust. It violates my conscience. So how do I understand that and what do I do with it? Well, what you're still written in the Torah, it's there. Yeah, it is indeed. And what you do, how you deal with it, is you say God wanted us to critique the Torah. God didn't just want us to accept the Torah. God wanted us to critique it and to follow the parts of the Torah that are the, the kernels of eternal wisdom and ethical truth that are in the Torah. They aren't buried in it. They're right there, easy to see. But you, you have to be able to believe that there is a right and wrong, which is the big obstacle that we have in contemporary culture in our debates about moral issues. So, oh, this is what you think is right, this is what I think is right, and we can't go any further than that. No, we have to go further than that. We have to be able to say, I want to hear your reasons. I may be wrong in, in, in holding the views I hold. So you either believe in the possibility of moral dialogue, rational moral dialogue, or you don't. And if you don't, what that means is whoever has the most power gets to pass all the laws they want. And that leads to a war of each against all. That, that leads to a society that isn't unified. And, you know, I think ultimately we're at that point in our culture. All right, but let's go the other way. So if I do believe that there's a right and wrong, and that we human beings can can at least approximate it if we can't have it precisely. So we have this conversation. And I lay out my reasons and you lay it. So what you're trying to say is that revelation, that God's entry into the moral world of human beings is not the words written in the book. No, it's the conversation. It's the conversation or the or the reasoning, the process we bring to the conversation. Right. And this is where orthodoxy went radically wrong. They said, look, it isn't about the conversation. It's about what they call the Masora, which is these are the rabbis whose decisions we follow. And this is, the, and, and part of revelation is accepting 
the Mesora. Forget about, you know, oral and written. That obviously we accept. It's not just that, but after the rabbinic period, there's now an official list of approved poskim, of approved ex decisors of the law who we follow. And that's irrational. What we need is a way in which the discussion can occur with rational reasons that have nothing to do with the appeal to authority. So that you can't say in our discussion, well, it says in the Torah, therefore you're wrong. No, that's an appeal to authority. You have to say, well, here are the reasons why I think excluding women is rational. And then I've heard it said from rational Orthodox Jews, mitzvah says shazman grama, they say. These are the reasons a woman can't do this because let's say she had to take care of a child and you also had to daven shachri, uh, to pray the morning prayer. You, and she'd be in conflict. We don't want her to be in conflict. So we're not going to make her obligated to do this. Fine. I said, okay, that's a good reason. If a woman feels conflicted and she has certain maternal duties that are that prevent her from doing fine. So she doesn't have to do it. But what if she wants to do it? If she wants to do it, then you don't have an argument. Then you don't have an argument and she should be allowed to do it. He said, oh no, can't do that because the mitzvah system is built on what's called chiyuv, obligation. And you can't do a mitzvah for which you're not obligated. There are certain mitzvahs women do that I can't do because I'm a man. All right? I mean, for example, ritual purity after menstruation. That, that's obvious that there are certain differences that are rational and there should be different laws because certain things don't apply to men that, and certain things don't apply to women. But if it's an irrational limitation, one that has no relationship to a reason that you can universalize, then it can't be included. And one of the things that come up is you shall not lie with a man the, the way you lie with a woman, the prohibition against homosexual relations. So, all right. If what you mean by that is you shouldn't rape someone, well, that's a good reason, but that's not what the verse is about. And it, it doesn't have anything to do with homosexuality anyway, because you shouldn't rape anybody. But if you say, this is an, this, in support of it, which I do, say this is a consensual form of love. And it is irrational to have a prejudice against a consensual form of love. Not talking about adults and children, but two consensual adults. There's no rational reason to condemn that. And therefore, we should change the laws that do condemn it and do prohibit it. So that's a conversation, Ed. That's right, a conversation. But, but there's a cost to this. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I want to elaborate a little bit more. Please. And here's, the, here's one of the costs of what you're suggesting is that there really is no moral certainty. See, if, if I say it's, it's, it's right or wrong because God said it, well, then I know it's certain. It's, it's clear. There's no question about it, right? But if you say it's right or wrong, because in our discussion, we have arrived at a set of reasons, and it looks to us like the reasons stack up on one side better than they stack up on the other side, then I'm always going to live with a certain degree of moral uh, ambiguity, a moral Correct. doubt, a moral, it's never going to be 100% right, it's 85% right, it's 75%. Exactly right, exactly right. And that's why verses in the Torah like the pursuit of justice. There's nothing in the Torah that says do justly, do justice, do justice. It's pursue justice. Mm -hmm. And and why does it say pursue it? Precisely because of the reasons you just articulated. You, you can't ever get justice. It's too hard. There's too many factors that have to be factored in and you may get it wrong. There was a time when people thought it was just to have slaves. And that includes the Bible. 
It includes the Tanakh. And we were wrong. We were wrong. And, and it requires time to sort this thing through and to realize that that's, that's not true now. So there's always the possibility that you're wrong. But that doesn't gainsay the idea that the way that God wants us to enact being made in the image is to use our brains and our heart to enact laws that we will enforce through the state that will enable us to flourish together. And that is what the Torah gives us. And it gives us in this portion, in the revelation at Sinai, not a, a not a, a GPS guide to the, to the point where we're going, but rather a set of principles that are we treating someone like they're made in the image of God? And if the answer to that is no, we're treating, and Buber's point of I and thou and I and it, it, there's all different iterations of this idea of how to bring God into our ethical decision-making without imposing some kind of, uh, they call it in philosophy, ipsy dixit, which is, I say, therefore it is. No, there, you have to believe that what you, everything we believe is subject to counter arguments. And you must be careful and loving and attentive and a good listener to listen to the counter arguments. Just because someone says you're wrong doesn't mean you're wrong. And, and, you, and it, you could be partly wrong. And maybe some changes need to be affirmed and others don't. So let's, let's trace back where we've come because this has been a wonderful journey. So this morning's Torah portion is all about the philosophical question of revelation. God reveals God's self to the people of Israel. The people of Israel gather at Mount Sinai and the Torah says, God came down the mountain and spoke to them and spoke to them. And all through the Torah, <clears throat> excuse me, all through the Torah, we are told that God speaks to Moses. God speaks to Moses and Aaron. God speaks to the people. And, and there are many, many Jews in the world and Christians and others as well, Muslims, who, who would say, I take that literally. God really said this stuff. And that it's true, these things have to be followed carefully. Rabbi Gelman and I have offered a couple of questions about this. First of all, it's hard to imagine this, because it's hard to imagine what it means to say God came down the mountain. Even the Torah, I believe, had the same problem, because if you try to read chapter 19 of Exodus, it's editorially, literarily a mess. It's a very confusing chapter about where Moses is, where the people are, what's actually happening. So the Torah itself is trying to say, this is hard to imagine. Number two, when you say God spoke, what does that mean? I mean, first of all, if a guy sits on the corner of Ventura Boulevard in Sepulveda, right outside my door here, and shouts to the world, God is speaking to me, and this is what he said, you know, they call an ambulance and these two guys come and they give him a little bit of Haldol and in a few days he'll feel better. We assume that kind of person's a little lunatic. Why is it it's not lunatic when it's in the Bible? And more than that, not just not lunatic, but how do you know it's God speaking to you? The real problem isn't the guy on the corner, you know, who's demanding our faith and our allegiance. The real problem is the person who said, God told me to do something horrifying. God told me to fly an airplane into a building. God told me to kill somebody. And, and, and you know, you can't argue with that, by the way. It's kind of hard to come up with rational arguments. So there's a, a problem with the whole question of the sanity of that question. And the third question has to do with, if God's giving us all the rules, right, then we're no longer responsible. We're no longer moral actors. We're just following these rules where does our own moral sensibility and moral rationality come into the process, come into the process? So Rabbi Gelman has offered us an alternative. 
And thank you, Mark, for playing moral philosopher this morning, in addition to being a you know, great rabbi, which is to say that the Torah is giving us principles, fundamental principles, the preciousness of human beings and the, uh, the possibility of creating the just society and a gentle community, but that God is demanding of us and asking of us moral rationality. And that what revelation really is, isn't the voice from on high shouting down, Feinstein, do this. It's the inner rationality, following those principles and applying them to my daily work, my daily life, trying to find a way to live as a moral person in this world. And that that rationality is actually the revelation of God in the world. And that all, and we're going to come up with differences as your rationality and my rationality see things differently. And that's what the great moral conversation is. If you open the Talmud, it's filled with this argument with a rabbi who says this and a rabbi who says that, because that's what the process is. The process is sacred of applying these fundamental principles, these foundational principles to the, to the conduct of daily life the conduct of daily life. But you also said one more thing, which is that the most important thing that God told us, that you can glean from not just the Ten Commandments, but the entire corpus of the revealed Torah, is that there is a right and wrong in the world. There is a right and wrong. It's not just my opinion. It's not just your opinion. And that, and that, we, that we have an obligation as human beings to reach for the right, to figure it out, and then to act it out and then to discipline ourselves to follow it. And that idea that there is an objective right and wrong in the world, that is a profoundly powerful, and these days a profoundly controversial idea. Did I get that right? Perfectly. Better than I said it. So, no, no. You, I just wanted to follow our train of thought. So I'll finish with this. My, the kids in school always ask me questions, and I've learned more theology trying to answer their questions, and I did from all my professors in seminary. And one of the kids said, did God really write the Torah? And I thought, at the moment the answer came to me, I said, yep, God wrote the whole thing. Only one small problem. God doesn't own a pencil <laughs> or a pen or a computer. So what did God use as God's instrument to write the Torah, the souls and minds and hearts and conscience of sensitive human beings. How would you like to become one of God's pencils and help write the, the rules of life? And the kid said, that would be really cool. I said, wonderful, you're elected, you're part of the process. Now that idea that yes, there's a God and yes, there's a God who demands right and wrong, but we are the instruments of working all that out. That is precisely the, the what that is a, a liberal way, let's call it that. That is our way of, of reading this morning's Torah. I'll ask all of you to give some thought to what the Torah means when it said God speaks. How do you know it's God speaking? How do you know this is the right thing to do? How do you, what is the role of your own sense of moral responsibility and moral conscience? In the, in, in the affirmation of what's right and wrong. Mark, thank you. A wonderful Shabbos to you. Good Shabbos, my friend. And to everyone, a happy Shabbos, Yitro. Take very, very good care. This morning at Valley Beth Shalom, we welcome the Neshama Minion. We'll be celebrating a wonderful Minion this morning. Happens to also be my wife's birthday this morning. So oh. let's give her, a, let's wish Nina a happy birthday. Give happy her a birthday, hug. Nina. And to everyone, take care. Have a wonderful Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.